Here we are, Ruth Wilson. Hello, hello. Ruth Wilson, you've got that same really bright sunshine as me. Did you have hail about two minutes ago too? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, What's going on? I know, it's typical British weather. I had to use a brolly to get into this little shed I'm in in the garden to save my laptop. And now, blue sky, glorious. It's like someone said that the UK is like you sort of, it can rain three times in 10 minutes. <laughs> it really can. <laughs> sun in between. <laughs> it's just mad. <laughs> it's mad. Um... Ruth, there's, there are so many things I want to talk to you about today. One of them being your new film, True Things. And obviously, like, strange nature of film means that you will have said goodbye to your character, Kate, from the film a long while ago now because you're probably working on numerous other projects. And I wonder, when it comes to, to this part where you're sort of talking about projects, do you still have a little bit of that character with you or are you just kind of, like, discard, drop onto the next thing? Usually I sort of let go of them quite quickly. I think Kate felt more like me than many of my characters I've played. So in some ways, there's always a bit of Kate in me because there's parts of me in there. Like what bits? I think the sort of inner clown of me, (laughs) which no one really sees on screen. I don't really show that on screen much. I'm usually sort of, you know, Mrs. Coulter, sort of powerhouse, psycho, whatever. (laughs) Psycho, whatever. (laughs) Psycho, whatever, you know. Uh, but this, there's sort of a quirk and a, a, a it's like oddball quality to Kate, which is probably the real me, which I don't really expose much. So I think there's a little bit, and we worked on that script for years, like K- Harry and I sort of anecdoted and worked from talking about our own stories and friends we knew and all sorts. So it felt quite honest portrayal of both things we've been through. So I think when it came to filming it, it was... I kind of understood her quite well and she was basically bits of me in there as well as bits of Harry as well as bits of other people we knew um so I I kind of feel like in some way it's the most me I have been so in terms of letting go of her I think she's just stuck with me unfortunately (laughs) (laughs) the good bits the the good quirky idiosyncrasies when you're playing a role usually how much of yourself do you allow into that role? Is that something you consciously have to think about? I think you can't help but have your essence on the screen. I think it's just, you can't really hide it. And that's what people are attracted to and what they watch, actually. You can do whatever you want to put an accent on or uh, put makeup and hair and do all sorts, but essentially your essence will always come through. And and it's about you accepting what that essence is, I suppose, and actually then leaning into it. I I think that's quite hard to do. And for me, that's, I'm just starting to do that a bit more, I feel. I mean, I haven't for years. So it's, I mean, Jane Eyre maybe was quite me, actually. It was my first job when I felt utterly shit scared <laughs> of what I was doing. So I was, I think that was kind of probably quite true to form. I used a lot of that in the part. But yeah, I think you spend a lot of time putting on layers and actually it, it, you come to a point where you realise actually I've got to strip back and just be observed. So does that require you to really know who you are which is kind of a never-ending endeavor because when do we ever truly know who we are but I'm imagining you have to have quite a good awareness of that to know what bits to put into a role yeah I think it's um I don't know it's sometimes just allowing yourself to be you and that's it's parts of you to come out rather than try and create bits like that you just have to let it flow and be a bit more honest about who you are and actually think that it's okay to be seen in that way I mean, I think that often I would feel, okay, me is not very interesting. I'm not a very interesting person. Why would anyone want to see me? Like I'm playing characters. I'm investing in a person of a lived experience I've never had. And so I think it's actually about thinking or accepting that you could be interesting to watch. (laughs) (laughs) Which you are very interesting to watch. And then you go, okay, now I can actually relax a bit and be watched a bit more and actually maybe more you can feel more relaxed in front of the screen to then sort of be more truthful in some ways. So if you're playing a character where they do have undesirable traits and, you know, many of your characters are very strong and distinct in <laughs> what, they, what they do and, uh, and how they act, do you have to then sort of have acceptance of there might be a bit of that in me? I'm, you know, because we've all got obviously sort of great traits and bad, but sometimes we don't want to look at the bad stuff. It's much easier to sort of focus on... Well, maybe not. Maybe we're actually really good at uh, noticing the bad bits of ourselves, sort of saying that aloud. I'm probably much better at going, 
I'm awful at this. I know that I've got this ugly trait here. I don't know. Maybe it's different for everybody. But how how do you find that? Are you quite accepting of your your fallible bits, the bits of you that you're not so keen on? Well, like you said, it takes ages to work out what they are. I mean, yeah. it takes ages to know yourself and even identify when you're doing something or when you habitually act in a way or how you respond to something and know that that's, oh, that's me doing that again. It takes ages to kind of identify that and not blame the other person or not blame the situation or not, or blame yourself and think I'm terrible. I'm an awful person. You know, I think to get to a place of non-judgment is really difficult and hard. I mean, when I'm creating characters, like I think I have to understand them or I have to kind of find something that I can understand about them. So I remember with Alice Morgan, you know, I was thinking how she's a psychopath, you know, I watched every psychopath movie going and I sort of did a deep dive And I remember reading this John Gray novel, he's a philosopher, and he was talking about, which I hear in meditation a lot now, actually, about the idea that, you know, energies, it's feelings are energies, or it's just sort of things going through your body. It's not, we put terms onto stuff, we put fear, we put guilt, we put anger, love, we put terms onto sort of chemical feelings going around your body. Or I thought, oh, that's interesting. So if Alice Morgan can disassociate from the feeling, she can just see it as energy, then she can act without guilt. She can do things and not feel anything for it. So I was like, ah, now I can have fun with this part because now actually I get, I understand the, actually it's fun. It's like she's, she can play because she feels like she's actually got something on these other humans Mm -hmm. that are so at the will of their feelings. And does that ever help you explore those themes in your own life are you able to go well maybe I could feel less guilt in that circumstance or whatever it might be that you're exploring yeah I think it does and and again it might be like 10 years later (laughs) you go oh that's interesting but yeah I think you yeah it does definitely my I love my job for that reason it's it's a exploration of self and of humans and I constantly have to put myself in places of removing my judgment about myself but also about other people and that's an amazing amazing privilege actually well it's also a hugely powerful thing to do because most of us are struggling on that level with judging ourselves more than anyone we might think we're outwardly judging others but we're all judging ourselves so much so I think for you to consciously have to do that for work is such an amazing tool I know that I would be a lot less stressed most of the time if I actually consciously looked at how much I was even judging myself, had that awareness. So it's huge. And I wonder, sort of flipping that the other way around, the, the more you're willing to or, or already looking at your own self-growth or self-expansion, does that change how you then approach a role or just acting in general? Yeah, I think I've been really, I was sort of thinking about what I've picked in the last sort of five years, really in terms of roles. And I realized that I, it's not just characters I pick, it's kind of the, it's what the material is dealing with. And often it's, it is about an exploration of psychology or of, of mind and and female psyche. So, you know, if I think about the affair, that was a narration from two points of view and that it was from the male perspective and the female perspective. And it was like how you see yourself and how others see you and the conflict of that. So I love the idea of that I can play what people think of me and I can play what I think of them. And for example, and so in that with Alison, I thought, okay, he doesn't see me. Noah doesn't see Alison. He doesn't understand that she has a dead child. He doesn't know that. So he doesn't see any grief on her. So I thought, okay, I play that character without grief because without having lost a child, because he doesn't see that. But my version of it is I'm overwhelmed with grief and I'm through the fog of grief. So I thought that's really interesting. And then his dark materials, you know, it's like a woman, the psyche of that character is split between demon and human. So it's like, how does that work? And then these two films, True Things, and then the play that I'm doing, The Human Voice, they're both about, in a way, they're sort of companion pieces, actually, I hadn't realised, but they are about the sort of act of imagination. Kate in True Things has this incredible ability to romanticise and idealise this person that's in front of her. And whether that comes from expectation or it comes from a desire not to be lonely or it comes from real chemistry, whatever that is, it's this amazing act of imagination that sort of blinds her to reality. And in the human voice, people will watch that and wonder, I have a phone, it's a phone call for an hour 
and it's with my a final phone call between me and my lover. And you never hear the other person speak and it's not written. I've had to write the other side just to get a sense of what that might be. But you will think, I think as the audience at some point, is she just talking to herself and creating this whole thing? Mm. So I, I think, ah, that's interesting. So I'm drawn weirdly to a study of human psyche as much as I am to individual character, I think. Same, same here. I'm in a completely different yeah. job, but <laughs> I am endlessly fascinated because, well, it's an endless subject for a start. And there's always something to learn. And there's always a huge revelation, you know, constantly. And I love that. I feel very lucky that I, I get to do this job and just sort of talk to people. And I'm sure you feel the same with sort of diving into these brilliant characters. And, you know, let's talk about Kate, because when I was watching True Things, I was like, oh, my God, I know. I know these feelings. I know these feelings so well. <laughs> We've all been there. Oh, all been there. Ruth, it, <laughs> time and time again. <laughs> it was that scene where Kate was running back to the flat with a bag of eggs and bacon. And I felt like the running and you're sort of sweating a bit and you're just desperate to get back there, hoping that in this case, Blonde is still in the flat and you kind of know he's not going to be, but you're desperately trying to get back there and working out ways to keep him there. And maybe this, the eggs and bacon will keep him there. And I thought, oh, I did that for so many years. Oh my God, it's terrifying. It was such a small, you know, non-verbal moment that I felt deeply. And I think for so many people, men and women watching this film, they will know, they will know that dynamic so well. So many of us, you know, maybe... For me, it was when I was in my 20s, but maybe people are going through this at different parts of their lives. But certainly when you're younger, you end up in these very imbalanced relationships. And it's all part of, I guess, you know, the trials and tribulations of being young or exploring relationships. But the dynamic between Kate and Blonde is so imbalanced. And I mean, literally every relationship before I got married was like that, basically. And I wonder why so many of us end up in imbalanced dynamics like that. And when we know that they're not right and we stay in them, what do you think the reason is? Well, that's my, that is my question, because I think there is an imbalance of power. But I also think, I always thought with Kate, is that she is at the will of this guy in a way. And he is, he's badly behaved and he doesn't get back and he ghosts and... But it's her expectation. It's her that's driving the story. She's the one, he, he asks her out, but she's the one that says yes. She's the one that looks for his number and she pursues him. She persists. She gets him. And then when she kind of goes, Meh, she dumps him. So in, even though she seems a victim and she seems passive and shy and at the will a, a bit of his bad behavior, she's kind of choosing to be in it. And I suppose that's the question we're asking is why do we do that? And part of me felt, well, is it, is it expectations? Is it like what you are trying to fulfill? You're trying to be something for everyone. You're trying to be what your mom and dad want. You're trying to be what your friends want. You're trying to be everything. So this is like, this man will complete that. This man, this relationship is going to be the thing that makes me fit in. Is it like I said, like the like the loss, the desperate need not to be lonely? This character seems quite lonely in some ways, and so the idea of having something, the safety of having something, and the like the being on your own, having to face yourself, is really tough. And in a way, this film is a self actualization through him. She kind of realizes more about who she is. But interestingly, also that relationship is really exciting. It brings her out of herself. She discovers things about herself. He reveals things in her. He sees how weird and quirky and fun she is when other people don't. So it's also about actually those relationships are wild and fun and they're kind of, there's something exciting and necessary about them too, which is about a sort of freedom outside of the norm or going against the norm or whatever it is or following your instincts. I think all that's in there. It's quite complex, but it's, we wanted to explore all of that, that actually, again, not in a non-judgmental way of her, is that she's part responsible for that dynamic, but also it's not all bad as well. Yeah, I, I really felt that excitement. And, you know, like many early, even if it's not a relationship, but sort of moving into lust with someone and, and experiencing that, you do, like it, 
as painful as it was to watch Kate sort of walk towards the fire at times, you go, oh my God, I remember that mm. feeling of like my own daily routine has gone out the window. And I'm usually like, I'm very, I'm a Virgo and I have the same thing for breakfast and then I like things to all run smoothly. When, I, when I've fallen in love or lust before, it's like, fuck that. And I'd be out till two in the morning and inside I'm going, oh God, I should probably be in bed. But I'm like, it doesn't matter. I'm feeling the feelings of lust. And it is just this, what? it's chaos, isn't it? It's like total chaos. And I loved that for Kate. I was going, this is wonderful. She needs this. She needs some excitement. Get out of the office, go and have some fun. You know, until it turns into it being detrimental. It is this beautiful chaos that we don't experience in everyday life, I guess. No. And there's one thing that Harry, the director, she talked about was that it was a bit like um, she always sort of referred to Midsummer Night's Dream and the magic dust of love or infatuation. And, and it's like it sprinkles on you. It takes over your whole brain, your mind, your body. It's chemical. You can't stop thinking about it. You become obsessive. It's like an obsessive infatuation. And, you know, you fall in love with a donkey. And then the veil lifts. And that weird moment when the veil does lift and you're like, oh, God, yeah. he walks really weird. Or, oh, his earlobe is really... And his shoes are shit. His shoes <laughs> or something. And suddenly, and suddenly it just, wow, clarity. And you're like, no, he's just a donkey. And then so it's like... It's so hard. <laughs> that, that whole thing is, we've all been there. And I just think men and women, it's like such a universal experience of, I, I don't quite know what that's about, but it's it's exciting and mad. It's maddening. Maddening. It's maddening. And um, I sort of think, thank God for it, actually, because it's, yeah. it's quite... There, there is something like a few years later, you look back on and go, why on earth did I go out with that guy? Or what was that about? But it's sort of thank god i did have those experiences because they were they were sort of wild and weird and you're yeah. just at the will of something you know and it's they drag cool. you out of your everyday normality and sort of habitual routine and and it's great storytelling for down the line i mean i not that i can tell any of them but i've got bloody loads <laughs> do you know what i mean i've got loads of the things and correct me if i'm wrong but my interpretation of and i won't spoil the ending for people that haven't seen it but how kate sort of moves at the end of the film yeah it seemed to me that at the beginning she was either unaware of her own self-worth or or lacking in it and she sort of accidentally found it along the way would you say that's right yeah I, I think there's something about I always kind of I always felt that Kate was someone that was artistic at heart like that maybe her backstory was that she had gone to art school and then it never quite found itself anywhere she didn't quite land anywhere didn't have the confidence to follow through with anything or didn't have the confidence I think in who she was and what she was and and in a way then was kind of a passenger in her own life was just going along with finding a job that her friends got not exciting her you know she sort of becomes quite isolated probably a little bit depressed but it's about not having value self-worth and weirdly through her relationship with him she finds her self-worth. It's kind of, she almost has to go to rock bottom to discover that. And he does recognise things in her that she hasn't fully realised herself. It's so interesting, you know, as um, an outsider to Blonde and Kate's relationship, and also if we use our own past experience as an example, we can have a look into those dynamics. And we might often assume that in this case, Blonde has more self-worth because he's being a bit more nonchalant about the dynamic, etc. And we might feel the same if we have been the victim or the person that has been messed around in the past. But that's often not the case. I don't think they've got any more self-worth or self-respect. They're just acting their own uh, insecurity out differently, I yeah. suppose. Yeah, I mean, when we were discussing Blonde, because in the book, he's objectified. I mean, he's not given a name. He's called Blonde. You know, it's like, it's quite, um, in a way, he could have been just quite a stereotypical guy that was good looking and charming and, you know, came into her life like a whirlwind and left. But Harry was always quite keen to sort of show why they might connect and that make it, it's important that we do see them sort of connect and that he has vulnerabilities himself and that he is acting off his own place of insecurity and intimacy issues. And that that's the reason he, he can't connect with her in that way. So that's always, again, it's about seeing all the sides of every story and he has one as much as she does, even if he's 
not seen so clearly as we see Kate. Yeah, have you seen have you seen uh, ther- couples therapy? Have you been watching? No, it's amazing. It's just such a brilliant. Uh, it's very well done, and it's a brilliant observation of humans and how they they get into tram lines of kind of dynamics. And it comes from back past histories. And so if you haven't dealt with your own past history, it's very hard to identify why you're acting in that way, but they become habitual. So it's like un- you have to unpick people's and their past. You have to unpick where they come from and why they're doing certain things and then help them to address that in their present relationships. I think me and my husband just sort of doing that accidentally all the time. <laughs> like. Why do you leave all the cupboard doors open? Oh, right. Okay, let's go back into your childhood. Yeah. <laughs> what phone? Why are you such a control freak? Well, let's take a look at your mum. And, you know, we get there and we work <laughs> it out. It's deeply fascinating. But I think looking at the example of Blonde and Kate, it's really liberating for people that have felt messed about to go, oh, right, no, the person who was doing that, who seemed in control, who seemed the one to be in power is equally as full of insecurity. I I really felt that from watching it and it was quite liberating looking at my own past going, oh, I can see now why things didn't work and why people act in certain ways. Where do you think, and I'm, I'm interested to know what you think through working with the character Kate, but also maybe your own experiences of where self worth comes from. Do you think it's age, experience, perhaps uh, cultivated with a little bit of discipline. I'm not even sure myself. I think I could probably only pin it on experience myself, but I wonder what you think. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think that, I think sometimes parenting, like, you know, the sense of when you grow up, like how you're perceived by your parents and given sense of self-worth of like autonomy and strength. I, I think some some of it will come from that. I. I, I know that I've got like a deep down, I have got a very strong sense of self-belief, but I kind of cover it up sometimes or I, or I sort of hide it or I don't hide it. It just, it's sort of something that I, it disappears every now and then or something, or I kind of, or other things get on top. So I don't quite know where that comes from and why that happens. But I think self-worth, like you said, experience, like, I mean, me, me my career, it's like, that's, taking me a long time to feel okay now I I've done enough now (laughs) I can have a break (laughs) I don't approve myself every time I can now experiment a bit more or have a bit more fun or try something really random or step outside the box and not chase I can actually just be and that comes from experience and doing it over and over again and also I guess uh facing a lot of what you faced as an actor I've faced certainly in my line of work not so much these days because I sort of do my own thing now but rejection you know you you, ha- you have to face rejection as an actor it's it's a given that that's going to be part of your path that there, there is no exception there and perhaps having to deal with that makes you look at well no I know what my worth is even if this person doesn't see it yeah and you have to if you want to continue otherwise you'd give up after the first audition yeah exactly so it's a, it's a resilience and determination that's why I said like actually the belief to get through that and to keep sort of continuing despite all that stuff I don't know where that really comes from I think there's something about being seen like really truly being seen like we always talk about that about finding friends or relationships and who people that kind of can see you and don't judge you for your big emotional moments or (laughs) when you're having a breakdown or when you're manic and you know they kind of love you for all those bits and that helps self-worth definitely because if you're not ashamed of it you're not made to feel shame for those things then you can fully be realized and yourself and not yeah and kind of enjoy it yeah so you have to have the right people around you for, for you certainly to do the job you're doing you have to have the right people around you yeah and trust that you can take those risks and you'll be held in some way or people won't I don't know it's it's, it's interesting I don't know I think it, it, over time you just like you say time age and experience <laughs> yeah and hopefully you gain it you know my yeah, mom, certainly. Mom now, my mum now she's like in her 70s and she's she seems happier and more content than I've ever seen her, Mm. you know? And so I think that that's the journey of life. You just get to a point of full acceptance in a way of who you are. Yeah. I mean, we're at a similar age and I certainly, when I turned 40, in a, in a sort of cliche way, but I know it's also due to sort of experience and, and, and what I've been through, do feel 
Like I can just be me. And I certainly didn't before. I certainly felt that there had to be a bit of a cover up job to be, well, like you mentioned earlier, like sort of to appear interesting or why would people listen to me? Whereas I've sort of found what I now believe is my strength and what I want to do. And I feel relatively good about that. And I think age is, is a big one. And and perhaps you can't really force that. I couldn't be who I am now in my 20s. It's You almost have to go through all of that to get to it, maybe. I thought there was like a loss, sort of interesting. When I'm, I'm just turned 40, so it was interesting. You do reflect a lot. And I was like, oh, it's interesting. When you're in your 20s and 30s, there's a lot of blind optimism because you you don't think about death. You don't think about the end. You're kind of like, I'm going to live forever. And it, you just there's an optimism of what you can achieve and what is out there and what's possible. And I think you do come to a point of going acceptance that that's not always the case, but I'm going to go this way or that way. You know, it's like, actually there's a sort of, there feels like a slight grief over that boundless optimism. But actually with that is wisdom and a more sense of acceptance. Yeah. The illusion shatters, doesn't it? To some extent you go, Oh, actually that whole mad dream that I wanted to fulfill my priorities are so different to how they were in my 20s I think it goes for most people that you do go off on different tangents and 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 like you say there is grief I certainly had that when I sort of left my old broadcasting career the thing I'd done for years and years and started out doing new stuff like who am I in this role what does this mean you know I'm letting go of all this stuff but it's exciting it's a good thing and and it's nice to to feel comfortable I don't think you know I I certainly still have insecurities and I might not ever feel completely comfy in my skin and there's an acceptance there as well but it certainly feels like I'm I'm getting there and that's and like you say with your mum I've got friends who are in their 50s 60s 70s and and most of them do say apart from the aches and pains it does get better you know it does get better and you feel more you if there is such a thing you you were talking a minute ago about let's talk about Kate specifically again and and her sort of backstory that maybe she went to art school and and all the stuff that we don't see. We're not seeing that in the storyline. That doesn't appear in the narrative, but you've worked that out to build this character. And you have to be, when you're an actor at the level you're at, when you're doing shows on Broadway, big films and TV shows, you have to be fanatical about a character. It's a given for you to portray the character with that vividness, you have to be fanatical. Would you say you're like that as a person or is this a skill that you've you've had to learn? I was thinking, I was just thinking, I was thinking earlier when I was thinking about true things, we were talking about infatuation, obsession. I kind of have that with my job. Like that same over, it overtakes my brain and my, I'm doing a play now, and I'm in rehearsals and it's a constant kind of stress. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> I'm like, uh, uh, and it's fear. It's a kind of fear and it's excitement all rolled into one. And, uh, and, and it's like trying to find, solve a puzzle. And it's, I find it, it's obsessional. I, I kind of can't let go of it. And that's why I've done this job or maintain or continued doing it. It always surprises me. It always, it constantly challenges me. I don't feel it ever sort of gets massively easier, <laughs> weirdly, but I sort of, I'm, I'm sort of always drawn to it. So it's, it is my first love, I think. You know, I have, I have a lover, but this is my first mm. love and he knows that. <laughs> <laughs> that's good that you've set the boundaries there and he knows where he stands. <laughs> Like, uh-uh. <laughs> this comes first, your second. I love that. It, it's so funny. I, I, again, I feel very similar in, in terms of that. And I'm, you know, and my husband would vouch for that. I'm very um, fanatical about what I do and I really, really enjoy it. And it also scares me absolutely shitless. And sometimes I do wonder, why am I doing this to myself? I would quite like to sleep tonight. Like, why am I doing this to myself? Do you ever get to that point where you think, Actually, this, either the stress or the, you know, and we all know there are people out there who are doing really stressful things and really stressful jobs and life-saving jobs and all sorts. But th- there is a certain stress with this because you care about it. And that's a given. If you care about something and you want it to go well, there is stress there. There is fear there. Is there ever a time or have there been times where you've thought, it's actually too much. I'd really like some peace. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I think... I think there's, yeah, definitely. I've had moments where I've just done too much. Like I did, I uh, was going from, I think it was his dot materials and doing my grandmother's story, Mrs. Wilson. And 
at the same time, I completely, I think doing my grandmother's story, I sort of blew my thyroid. Oh my God, I, can't, I, I can imagine. <laughs> so I, yeah, so I, I kind of had to, uh, now to take like thyroid pills every day, I was like, damn granny, you took my thyroid. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think I, I know that I have to protect that a bit and take more time and be more caring. I'm going to play again, it wraps up with self-worth and what you need to do and feeling at ease now with where I am. So it means that picking projects is a much more picky and I know what it takes out of me each time I do a job. So I have to be sort of more aware of that. But I also think it's like, my partner said something quite interesting. He said, you know, it's a habit that you kind of also build that energy up when you're doing a job. Like it's, it's almost part of what you feel is necessary to do the job. And it's, it's probably not true, you know, in a way you don't have to have so much stress. You could have, you know, it's like about pulling back and knowing you'll do the work anyway, but the added stress doesn't help. It just kind of, you know, so he, it was quite interesting again, that there's a sort of something, it's a sort of safety mechanism sometimes create that energy in order to do the work, or you think that you can't do it without that, or it's not the same if you don't have that sort of weird manic, manicness yeah it becomes like a strange superstition that you have to go through this sort of ritual feeling like totally on edge before you do something and then the relief I often look forward to the relief afterwards and then I get to the relief and think I actually really enjoyed that I wish I'd been a bit more present in doing the thing I was doing it's it's so strange um how do you cope if you're if you're working with a character who has a particularly heavy storyline or the emotions that you're going to have to display and work with are of a heavy nature that is obviously draining and i'm imagining does impact you because you're so and and obviously we all know that there's a connection between our body and our mind and there's a stress response and if our brains are telling us we're stressed our bodies might come out with an ailment a backache a, a sore throat a migraine whatever on a physical and emotional level how how do you put things in place so you can cope with heavy subject matters and, and emotions I do a lot of exercise because and I do that if I'm not working as well I do it all the time and it's something that just gets me in my body physically it removes it sweats it out it kind of gets the feelings out it makes me feel more sane so I I do that religiously and always have done actually or certainly the last five years it's been something that's become quite a religion for me in some way and and whether it's yoga or it's sort of spinning or hit classes or oh, you know, spinning is so rough it's so rough it's so rough but I love it and I love it you know those sort of cycle when you turn the lights out it's all like it's like a club and you just a club thing going mad <laughs> um and then I also I've started doing meditation a lot as well which really helps I'm doing that every day and I started doing that actually during King Lear when I had my thyroid problem I was really I was an underactive thyroid so it was I was just kind of comatosed pretty much and I was rehearsing for King Lear and I had to play the fool it was it was kind of a weird time but I felt really unenergized but it kind of helped me and I was I started doing loads of meditation and I just I felt that really I don't know something calmed me down entirely and took all I just was kind of in the process of it I, I found that really fascinating so I've tried to maintain that uh, and build it into a habit because I think actually that's it's a good way of when those energy when that energy is getting up or when you're overwhelmed or you're highly strung, you can just helps you calm you down. Mm. And it's often the last thing you want to do when you're feeling like that. You're like sod meditation. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go and make myself even more stressed and do yeah. more work stuff. It, you have to really because I you know swing in and out of doing it you know regularly and then not and oh god why have I fallen off the wagon again? I need to get back on to doing it because we know that it. It does. It does help hugely. And then, you know, let's talk about Mrs. Wilson, because mm. oh, like everybody, I absolutely loved it. And I was, you know, the whole way through watching it thinking, I wonder, you know, didn't know I was going to be interviewing you about this one day, but I wonder how this is impacting you as a granddaughter, you know, playing the role of your grandmother in an extreme storyline, which is true, is something else. And I guess, first of all, I wonder if you've felt well, I'm imagining you did for a huge amount of responsibility to tell that story, not only for your grandmother, but for the whole of your family and your family tree. Yeah, it was massive responsibility. I mean, we 
we found the story out probably about 20 years ago now and it's quite interesting in my family no one ever people weren't crying about it or anything it was like it'd been so long ago it felt so remarkable it felt so weird I never knew my grandfather so he kind of seemed like a mystery to me anyway it felt quite removed so everyone was like wow this is an amazing story and through it we've met all these new family members and it was all quite positive so there was always a like a suggestion of making it into a drama or doing something with it. And because I was in the world of acting, it was like, well, you make it. <laughs> and the more people I told about it, the more I realized it was a great story. Every time I told it, people were like hooked. So I thought, okay, this has got legs to be made into a drama. And then doing it though, it was, yeah, I, I thought, wow, I've got lots of people to serve. My grandmother, of course, and my grandfather and the memory of my grandfather. I mean, lots of so my dad and my uncles and all these new family members that knew him have very fond memories of him. So it's really important that we didn't just demonize him, but we kind of, again, went through their experience of what they remembered from their father. Um, and then all the other people that we've put on the screen, uh, my dad's on, you know, a version of my dad is on the screen and my uncle. So I would have to go through the scripts and I took them to each family member that was involved with those particular episodes and made sure they were happy with what was on there and if they had any notes and they didn't really again they were so positive and supportive it was quite easy and straightforward actually but doing the performance was hard and I found it really hard because again it was a little bit like me trying to create my grandmother and I just couldn't remember parts of her which was really upsetting to me she, she lived around the corner from my house. So she died when I was about 22. So I knew her very well, or what I thought I knew of her. Um, and I didn't know the story at all. And uh, she, so I couldn't remember her voice and things like that sort of made it feel stressful. And actually it didn't matter. There's loads of her in me. So just be me and it was fine. But that was sort of what I was talking about earlier about like playing characters and covering yourself up because you're sort of thinking you're so different from the person you're playing, but actually there's an essence there anyway, and certainly with that role. But what was amazing, and I have to say a real gift, I didn't realise it at the time, but when we screened it, I screened it to all my family before it went out publicly. And we had a screening for about 30, 40 family members. And it was amazing. It was, there was a five minute sort of silence at the end and people were all in tears and everyone was hugging each other. And it was, it was like a story that hadn't been told, was shared, was shared experience. These people all could sit and sort of reflect on where they'd come from and what their mothers had been through and who their grandfather or who their dad was. And actually that, the greatness of actually the amazing thing that's happened is that we've all come together and connected. And I found family members who were in the acting world that were never in my immediate family. So suddenly it totally made sense of my journey and where my acting came from was from my grandfather. I mean, he was the greatest the actor. The greatest actor. Yeah. The greatest actor. I mean, <laughs> it is the most sublime story. And another thing, me and, me and my husband watched it together and we were sort of discussing this because I think we've both done a lot of digging into our own lineage to sort of try and work out why we are like we are like we talked about earlier and actually my husband said to me do you think that and I was like that's that's going in today's interview yeah. do you think that Ruth playing this character of her of her grandmother and reenacting it is actually helping to heal some of that trauma in in the lineage there because most people of our generation that there, there will be trauma in the lineage because a lot of our grandparents lived through the war so there's always going to be trauma there one of my nans was evacuated in the war and it was a really awful situation she ended up in she wasn't looked after properly and obviously very extreme situation for a young kid to not be with your in your family home with your parents in London. It affected my nan for life. You know, she had really poor mental health, which massively affected my mum, which has in turn obviously affected me to a level. And we're all carrying that family trauma. Often we don't perhaps look at it enough and see why we are and our parents are like they are. And I wonder if reenacting that has, has helped heal any of that sort of uh, trauma in your lineage. Yeah, I think 
what was really interesting was about secrets and lies. And uh, in my family, there were, of course, lots of secrets. And my grandmother, you know, she, all the, all the wives, they, none of them told their kids the truth. So the history of who their father was, was never revealed. And it's only through this that we found each other and we understood who he really was and who they were and what they did. And so those secrets, those kind of living with those secrets and passing that sort of form, that, that down, the generations. You know, my dad was never encouraged to ask questions. My dad about his own father. And we weren't encouraged to ask questions of him about his grand, his, you know, his dad. So it was like this idea of secrecy and inability to express and keep quiet and, you know, get on with your whatever, don't ask questions. That is definitely a trauma that flooded through my whole family. And so having to, to reenact it, to dramatize it, to put it out there, to watch it and then see, to express it and put it all out into the open, I think has been quite, um, uh, purging in a way and certainly for my dad I think it was probably quite hard in some ways I think like I say no one really had deep emotions or didn't seem to have deep emotions about it uh, because it was so long ago, long ago and again they were encouraged not to have emotions about it it's you know whatever and not to know about it and to suddenly then sit with those emotions to see it actually dramatize see yourself dramatize see your story dramatized pretty intense um so intense and then and then to sort of be able to reflect on that and connect to it and I think our family has become more open as a result I mean it will take takes time to do that what I what I'm sort of really grateful for is that the whole family were really encouraging of it and in some way demanded it or needed it to happen and I think as a result it's much more connected and it you know I've felt there's a, there was a shame passed down as well from my grandmother, you know, the shame of being illegitimate, the shame of having illegitimate kids. And so that's opened up that and made us all sort of talk about it and discuss it. It's so brilliant because <clears throat> we don't do that. And I, and I can see it with my own family, you know, the generation above us, they weren't told to speak their feelings or to discuss or to ask questions, like you said earlier. And it's exactly the same in our family. There's still things that I think, oh, I'd never ask my mum or dad that. It'd be just too weird. And also, like, when do you say it? Like, they come for tea. Is it just in the middle of the mum telling me she's got me a house magazine? Then I go into it. Like, where does this happen? And I really noticed that when I did Who Do You Think You Are? Well, I don't know, it's probably ages ago now. And my dad was telling me all about his granddad, who he was like crying about. And I thought, what? This has been in you for all these years and we've never we've never done this. And I felt guilty. Why have I never asked these questions? Why have I never dared to? Because I felt it was too weird or out of place. But like you say, most of the time when things are out in the open, it's better. Yeah. And it's sort of, you know, my dad, I remember when we first found out about all this, we ended up going around. I mean, he moved house to house every year for 17 years in Ealing. He, he grew up in quite a traumatized, very poverty stricken household and they would move every year. And so we went into Ealing and we went around loads of different houses that he used to live in. And it was a way of him, I think it was traumatic and a lot of that was suppressed and held down and not reflected upon, not talked about, not talked about with his brother or his family members or his wife or his kids. So all this knowledge, and I think they did have knowledge about who their father was. They did sort of know. They were told not to ask questions. So then to suddenly have it revealed and then to actually find connection with other half brothers. And I think that's, it's been really, it's, it's kind of completed the circle from them and it's, it's answered lots of questions they had. Um, and so it's, it's vital to ask questions. It's really hard to do so. But I think so hard again, it's like it's about judgment and shame and those things that have, are so heavy on past histories that it makes it very hard for people to ask questions. Mm. But I, I think if we can all become less judgmental or sort of, you know, more curious uh, without judgment, then that's it can only make connections stronger between people. Yeah, without a doubt. I'd love to know when you're. And I know you're about to do your one woman show as well and and you're constantly 
having to become a new character, a new role and, and put yourself in another mindset and another life. And as we've talked about, you're fanatical about it and you want to get it absolutely perfect, you know, as perfect as you can with the background story, etc. Do you ever get so into a character that you lose a sense of who you are as a person? Um, I don't know. It's Again, it's like really weird, the sense of self. And I don't... No, I think um, like this this play is going to be quite interesting because I feel like each, even at the moment that it is supposed to be quite voyeuristic. You're watching this woman on a conversation on, on a phone call and actually it probably demands me again to be quite me. And we'll play with the idea of whether you believe she's talking to anyone or not. But essentially you want it to feel quite voyeuristic. And again, so I, I suppose again, like the idea of losing oneself it's a fine line because sometimes it's you up there. And I actually think the power will be with me to be myself because, and someone that's creating this. I'm, I'm not I'm not being very clear, but um, I think like, for example, if I forget my lines, which is the, <laughs> is bound to happen at least like four times, if not more, <laughs> uh, maybe at once every night, no one's gonna know. Now I have to turn the psychology around and go, okay, don't worry, no one knows. That's like my perfection thing will go, uh, like, but actually they don't know. And actually part of the job and part of this play is watching someone create something and then front, like fracture in their own, who, who really are they? It's, it's a, anyway, I'm, I'm not being very clear because I'm not. No, I get it. Well, it goes, it goes back to the question of, you know, how much of yourself do you put in the role? And maybe yeah. there is no answer to that ever because it depends on the role. It depends how much of yourself you need yeah. to give over. But I find it completely fascinating. And, and I'm, um, I, I wish you all the luck in the world with your, with your new show. It's brilliant that you're doing something, again, just completely diverse and different to the project before. And I loved watching True Things. And I, I know you're extremely busy, so I really appreciate you being on the podcast today. Thank you so much, Ruth Wilson. Thanks, Fern. It's lovely seeing you and talking to you. Thank you.